So I think we've now reached the point where you're in, into, uh, uh, to, into, a broader, into a broader discussion. And um, I, I, in, in some areas that we've covered today, I mean, I've just sort of review some of the things that we've discussed in the question of uh, the history of turbulence, which is the sort of theme of this, of this meeting. Um, one, of the, one of the sort of, you might say, outstanding issues which we've not discussed is the many distinguished people who worked in, in, in turbulence who have not from other countries than those represented by those um, uh, here or in the book. You, that might be a point you might want to raise. Um, you might want to raise another issue. There's the question of are schools of turbulence important or is it individuals? Or is it individuals and schools and individuals? Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things we've not discussed much today are the issues of computation, the development of computational methods in turbulence. So I suppose, uh, since we're not going to have a presentation about Richardson, I guess he would, uh, uh, from a historical point of view, perhaps be one of the people. But we talked a bit about G.I. Taylor. It's important to Taylor Green computation out to order T to the fifth, I think we got to. Um, and of course, one of the other issues that, uh, broader issues that we touched on was the role of other branches of science and mathematics, how they contributed to the historical developments. So this, that's just a, a, my shopping list of some general themes that possibly you might wish to, uh, to raise. So I'm hoping there will be some points or comments uh, from the floor or from these or anything other that we've discussed today. I just want to start one uh, maybe uh, try, uh, in this discussion, it's a relation between applied mathematics and mechanics on one side and physics as a physics of 20th century, namely already kind of, you know, influenced by quantum mechanics and other things. And I, I see how profoundly in Russian school it was people clearly defined, uh, kind of divided, but Kalmogorov never learned modern uh, physics and, for example, Gelfand did and Sinai did and Arnold actually never did. So this fact that great mathematician of 19th century all knew great physics of 19th century. Great mathematician of 20th century was somehow divided into it. In turbulence, I see again that, I mean, Yaglom was a physicist and Kraken was a physicist. And somehow my feeling that a lot of difficulties in our science in a few decades, maybe I don't know, was because we didn't learn how to talk. I mean, between mechanicists and statisticians and, and people who were quantum field theory oriented, and they're still learning it. So I just want to introduce this into discussion. Well, I, it's a problem and a richness of the subject. Uh, the European Turbulence Conference have people coming from many different branches. Um, but I agree with you, that's uh, the point. Uh, just on the subject of uh, the choice of, of the historical figures, I would like to read another quotation from the book. Many names of other departed colleagues come to mind for whom separate chapters could well have been justified. Burgers, Campe de Ferrier, Klebanov, Klein, Kovasani, Laufer, Liebmann, Lighthill, Loitsiansky, Monin, Obukov, Perry, Owen Phillips, W.C. Reynolds, Tani, Yaglom, Zhu, to name but a few. Their contributions are referred to in chapters of this book. We beg the indulgence of the reader in the choices we have made in the interest of providing a reasonably compact yet balanced picture. So I'm waiting for a burst of uh, proposals for comment. Yeah, Nicholas. So, so I also noticed there is a lack of computation, and, and I guess you could mention um, Richardson, but also von Neumann very early on um, giving a, really a kind of a program for um, direct numerical simulation of, of turbulence. And um, if we're thinking about uh, s numerical simulation, what major insight has come from um, numerical simulation that hasn't directly come from experiment or theory? It's an open question. No, I, well, many of us would think there were some positive things, and it goes backwards and forwards, so quite uh, importantly. Um, 
Mary Farge, do you have any points on this matter? Well, if you insist, uh, I mean, the truth, just for, I can talk for myself. I remember the first time I saw the result of UQ Canada, it was a shock. It was a shock for several reasons. The very first shock was that when, when you have this very general view of the old box, it was very, sp they were holes. So somewhere you had, you, you, you had a grasp of something which was a large scale, and at the same time, when you zoom in, you were seeing those vortex tubes. And you remember those years. I mean, the, we had very, f about the same time, we have this famous experiment by uh, Kuder about seeing these very large vortex tubes in 3D turbulence. And though there was this matching between experimental evidence that those objects, even at very large Reynolds number, they have this both large and small scale together. Though in a certain sense, this view, and it's still for me important, the fact that we are a little bit naive when we do, I mean, in the traditional way of thinking turbulence, because all the theory is made on ensemble averages and by assuming statistical isotropy, homogeneity, blah, blah, blah. And that gives us a bias, because we have this idea that there is an equation between wave number and scale. And this is dangerous equation. And there is also this dangerous thing that when you see one flow realization, you cannot think statistically. And when you see a spectrum, you cannot think deterministically. Though the good point with numerical simulation is that you can play with those ideas because now you hold everything, you are in the computer, so you can see in physical space, again, those vortex tubes. But then you can go to spectral space to do also some ensemble averaging and then you see the spectral slope. Though numerical experiment is a tool to try to do some, some links. It doesn't make sense by itself, but when it's coherent to some experimental evidence and when it can link with theory, it's a plus. I mean, just for myself, there have been several moments with numerical experiment where it was really enlightening. Do you agree with that? So that, that's, a, that's an interesting comment, and I guess m my own personal view is that when we can simulate numerically turbulent flows of very high Reynolds numbers um, very accurately, then we will have really learned something about turbulence. And I think that, that, that in learning how to do accurate, very high Reynolds number simulations, we'll learn something about the structure of turbulence. I don't think that we'll be able to to do a, uh, a, a direct numerical simulation or very accurate simulation until we, we learn about turbulence and in the process of trying to do the simulation, that's, that's helping us understand the flow. Well, from my experience, as it were, doing a little work with Dr. Ishihara and Dr. Kanida, when you've got, you, as you get higher Reynolds number, you get this incredible volume of data pouring out. So you've got to have some concepts and theories. So actually, it's localized and statistical theories are the only way we're going to understand this. We're going to be deluged. I mean, the, the problem of modern physics, in some sense, is a, is, is a deluge of data. Uh, and therefore, it goes back to, obviously, conceptual thinking is absolutely essential. Otherwise, uh, and, uh, and all the time, we, we need to do that. Um, we need some other people to speak. Come on now, you must be lots of questions. A lot of people have not asked any questions today at the back. You know. Look at your, look at your conscience. What you, you, you've got something to say, you know. Dr. Ishihara, you must have some view on this matter. <laughs> so I have a question uh, for uh, Professor Peters and um, uh, Professor Srinivasan, and that is, <coughs> it's my understanding that in the 30s there was um, some uncertainty about the skewness, and in fact, uh, von Kármán perhaps got it wrong and thought the skewness might be zero, but that Taylor really had an intuitive understanding that there was no a priori reason why the skewness should be zero. And I believe, and I'm not sure if it's in the volume, that that led to a paper being withdrawn. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, uh, neglected the triple. <laughs> triple correlation uh, in his equation, and, uh, but then he, uh, with the pressure from Taylor, he admitted his error, 
And, uh, and then in a footnote of the paper, he says uh, uh, he had committed that error, but now it was right. And of course, the outcome of this uh, term is the, uh, uh, is the uh, skewness uh, uh, is, uh, is negative. And uh, uh, so uh, it was pretty clear that water stretching uh, was an important uh, uh, fact, and uh, Taylor got it right and uh, saw it from the very beginning. I think while Professor Peters is on the floor, as it were, I wonder whether you would just like to comment a bit about the, some sense, the history of turbulence and the history of turbulent combustion and, and how these two things are, connect together because uh, you're creating turbulence in, in the body of a flow in a very special way. And to what extent are the general ideas of turbulence relevant to that or are they, are they special? Well, the, the point is that... Uh, uh, most of the combustion uh, uh, happens at, uh, in the flamelet regime, uh, flamelet or uh, what is called the thin reaction zone regimes, where the um, flame sickness, a, uh, a quantity uh, that is uh, determined by uh, chemistry uh, in com uh, combination with uh, diffusion, um, that gives a, a length scale and, and, as a consequence, a time scale of its own. And, uh, and these uh, lengths and time scales now compete with uh, the entire spectrum that uh, uh, is uh, evident in turbulence. So it, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, quantities then pick a very particular scale, and uh, well, that is a Gibson scale, and uh, um, so that is a, a way to uh, describe uh, turbulent combustion. Now. Um, there is another feature, and that is, uh, has not received much attention. You, uh, Julian, uh, yesterday in your talk, uh, pointed at the um, external intermittency uh, uh, and uh, the engulfment of, uh, of fluid into, uh, uh, into free uh, shear flows. And, and that is, of course, very important for combustion because uh, all, most of the combustion happens in these uh, superlayers. And, uh, uh, these, now, the question is, uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, work by Da Silva, uh, that um, there's still a controversy whether the thickness of the superlayer is uh, of the order of Kolmogorov scale or Taylor scale. And uh, uh, Corsian back in the uh, early 70s said it was Kolmogorov. But, uh, but uh, well, my, my uh, belief is uh, it's Taylor. And uh, uh, so... Uh, so there are aspects in um, the interaction between uh, turbulence and uh, combustion which uh, rely on the thickness of the structures in physical space. We have no, not much use of spectra in combustion, but in physical space we need to know more. In fact, one of the things that uh, struck, me, struck me today, or in, indeed reading some of the, uh, hearing about the chapters of this book, in a way, with our modern knowledge, we can understand, we'll progressively be able to understand this book because we'll understand some of the speculative ideas which were speculative, like the Bachelor Townsend uh, a paper of 40, of, uh, which is a very difficult paper to actually follow this question of higher derivatives and Reynolds numbers effects. Extremely difficult, but you can begin to interpret that when you've got some idea of these sort of structures and these structural, structural questions. And, uh, what was interesting was the hypotheses that were developed based upon obviously very limited, limited data. So it is quite, quite stimulating. So Professor Tatsumi, do you have any views on the uh, history of turbulence? Who are you asking me? Yes, I am, yes. <laughs> oh! Because you're probably one of the most senior people here okay. who, who've almost known everybody who's <laughs> been talked about. You know, my English is poor, so therefore I, 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 I employ simple words, maybe misleading. I have, of course, many questions in the present uh, theories of tablets. Yes, but uh, I wish to solve them by myself. <laughs> not, not, not uh, by talking with... Uh, yes, you know, yes. There is, it is not my peculiarity. Uh, the, to, to talk with, the, uh, with people about the difficulty is useless. So I wish to consider by myself. So, so, so therefore, I have uh, many questions, but I'm not uh, 
do not wish to talk with many people. <laughs> well, that may be the way forward. <laughs> So it was very interesting. It was a very interesting <laughs> point of view. Uh, yes, the lady there has a question. Okay, I would like to speak maybe a little bit about the future of turbulence. Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, well, an, an interesting observation is that turbulence is in the middle of nowhere, in the perfect emptiness of the boundary of the solar system. Uh, the Voyager has discovered a few weeks ago that in the helios sheets of the, sol, of the sun is full of turbulence, it's magnetic turbulence. So, but this is something astonishing and that, uh, in my opinion, should uh, draw people, the interest of people uh, to work on turbulence. It's a new, it's a new field. But on the other hand, there is a problem that there is a lot of people living in the field, actually, in these days. A lot of people? Leave. That leave the field of turbulence. Oh, really? Yeah. Because <laughs> there is no money and so on and so forth. We were saying that yesterday. But this is a new, very, I mean, something that can happen. Uh, well, can I just say, from, from, just from a practical or even political point of view, it's, it seems to me very interesting that uh, um, kind of inter, inter space turbulence around in the magnetopause uh, uh, and, and the sun, you know, has become of, of, of enormous interest to insurance companies, aviation companies, electrical power companies. Um, okay. and, the, and there's a lot of science which is, which is uh, not connected to the of science of turbulence in these areas, that is not connected to the other general community, and also, in my view, not, not, not connected as much to application as or forecasting, uh, uh, though that will soon be up upon us. We shall use forecasting methods for these areas of, of um, external turbulence and plasma because it uh, has such a big impact. But it, I think a, a future sort of generation of ETC meetings, we ought to perhaps get together more, I think, with uh, space turbulence people. Um, because there's a lot, a lot I mean, I've, I've reviewed some of these programs of those, of those institutions, and they, it's all Kolmogorov from beginning to end, uh, perhaps too much so. Um, but, but there's a very common language, um, and um, I think it's an area, it's, I think it's a good point that you make, really. Uh, yeah. uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much for uh, your comments uh, because uh, maybe between those people and space turbulence I'm also I involved because my paper in GRL is just in press. I can uh, tell you the, tit uh, the title. The observation of the multifractal spectrum turbulence at the termination shock by Voyager 1. And uh, many works on uh, turbulence has been uh, done by Barlaga, also from NASA, and we also follow this by uh, with my student and Vincenzo Carbone from the uh, group of the uh, University of uh, Calabria, and of course we follow, uh, uh, of course. Komogorov, Krajczyn, Scenario, Richardson, and so on. And, I, uh, uh, and of course, Menevus, Krinivasan, in 87 paper, I think he proposed a simple multifractal approach to turbulence. In my view, I think that multifractal theory proposed by Mandelbrot, a Polish or American or French mathematician, both of them. I think he died uh, last year. I met him many times in Nice, I think, during the geophysical con conference. He proposed a very good language for uh, turbulence. And I uh, think that uh, uh, this could be a natural language uh, for uh, considering these uh, poems of uh, Richardson, big ladies, small ladies, and so on. I, I think yesterday I was at the evening lecture of yours, and I tried to get from you 
uh, what is the essential characteristic of uh, turbulence besides we know self similarity deviation from self similarity uh, which according to fresh books is just intermittence is deviation from self similarity these are opposite concept uh, you have mentioned uh, viscosity is important but this is t t trivial thing in some some way uh, then then I just would like to know what is essential for turbulence and encourage you to look in the space data also because there you have turbulence free of charge. Okay. Question. Um, so could you give right. your name? You. I think it would be good. I'm sorry. What was your name? Uh, Martin. 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 Very good. Thank you. Okay, I should perhaps start to say that I am rather a physicist than a fluid dynamicist, and we have heard that turbulence is a very bright frontier. And as soon as we touch the upper end of length scales, which are dealt with, that means the really astrophysical length scale and so on, it's also possible just to focus our attention on smallest scales. And I have in mind, say, quantum tur turbulence, which I mm. had the privilege to introduce a little bit yesterday. Mm. And also, being a physicist, I am also aware about nuclear physicists who start to talk about turbulence, which is a possibility inside atomic nuclei or inside quark gluon plasma, which is being just done at CERN and so on. So that's one thing just to emphasize that this community should be open to uh, start to think about these things also. And from this point of view, sometimes if I just look at uh, ways how turbulence is researched now with so much emphasis on computer simulations, there is one warning which I would like to say as a physicist, and that's this. If you do experiment, you study nature. And if you do computer simulations, you study equations. Thank yep. you. OK, thank you. Any more points? Yes, behind you, please. Sorry. Could you give your name, please? Sorry. Uh, I have a following question. Because we don't understand, of course, turbulence even for water on, or air, but there is an important thing as non-Newtonian liquids which are important for any biological or medical flows. And I have a question, if you know, of course, about it, how to describe this kind of turbulence in this non-Newtonian liquids, as for, for example, viscoelastic liquids and so on, which are important, for example, for some flows, for example, prolif proliferation of uh, biological cells in living organisms, for example, for cancer cells and so on. This is really also important in so-called uh, new kind of physics called the cancer physics, which is a, some important subject of American Institute of Physics. And is any, uh, do you have any information about such, um, such uh, phenomena as turbulence in non-Newtonian non liquids? Well, that's, but one, of the, one of the attractions, of course, is both the computational and a structural approach is that it gives you, um, as the great Professor Peters was saying, it gives you a handle of looking at effects of either flames or particles or, or indeed, of course, classically non-Newtonian fluids in turbulent pipe flow can lead to suppression of drag and there are explanations of that based on a, on a structural knowledge of the eddy structure approach. So it, it, what people have had difficulty doing is finding a purely statistical approach when you introduce a, a, a totally new sort of, you know, a feature, but if you look at it in terms of structures, um, generally there's been a lot more success uh, in, in that approach, which is, what, of course, one of the practical reasons why so many practical people involved in turbulence look at the structural uh, description and modeling of that. Any other points? I think we're going to finish at five past six. Don't let five minutes is the golden five minutes. We've got some more. Is that where we're finishing? At some point. Some, yeah. Yeah, finishing. Are there any other? Um, Yes, Professor Mary Farge. Well, about the, what I'm presently very impressed about in our community is uh, um, how experimentalists has developed new techniques. I'm thinking about PIV in particular. 
I was a little bit surprised. I should confess that I was waiting for seeing more PIV results uh, in the last three, three days. And, and here is a question, let's say. Now let's make a kind of thought experiment. What would Townsend, what would Bachelor, I mean, um, Taylor and all those people we have made if that PIV at hand? And, and uh, just, so that's the question. And just a personal comment. I'm very, very much uh, hoping that soon we will see some joint, I mean, uh, numerical simulation, but using PIV data as input. I mean, we should develop this interface because to me, at least for myself, numerical experiments per se doesn't make sense. They make sense in relation with observational data and some good mathematical analysis to make sure that we are not doing nonsense. Though, let's know again, back to this question, what would the experimentators we have mentioned today would have made if they had PIV at hand? Was it critical to have that or is it just a little plus? Well, anybody want to comment on that question? Yesterday, because it was a comment or question to you, why do we not have a mathematical theory of turbulence? I would comment that that is not so bad. Uh, because there are different, different approach to uh, turbulence. Of course, if you could solve a uh, Navier-Stokes equation, you know everything about turbulence. Like uh, in hmm. quantum mechanics, Schrodinger equation. You basically know this equation, but like in Schrodinger equation, you, know, you should know to solve a particular problem. You should uh, find the potential. Uh, because uh, the same difficulty appears in Navier-Stokes equation because you have nonlinearity. And with nonlinearity, the cope is very different. On the other hand, you have simulation. Uh, there is another approach. And the third approach, which is very important, is geometrical approach, phenomenological model for t turbulence. Uh, this means following. Uh, I think we. I yeah. think, okay. we, I think, I think we've, we've heard that. Your you point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, can I, I, I'd like to make a neg sort of negative point. One of the um, uh, sort of um, points you could say was that when people had a limited amount of data, they speculated like crazy about all the things they couldn't measure, and many of those are very interesting. So in fact, you always want to speculate about things you can't measure, you can't calculate. And so the, limit, the existing limitation is actually a source of fruitfulness. You should always be thinking about what it is you can't do, like, for example, you know, putting additional forcing on. So, so I think you should be very positive about what we can't do, because that will give you the ideas about what we may want to do the next generation. Anyway, I think on that very positive negative note, I think we've, uh, uh, we'll now hand over to, to uh, Conrad to lead us into the next stage. You would have noticed by now that I'm fascinated not only by turbulence, but by the book itself. So, uh, although it's built essentially around people, it contains an epilogue with a two-page table, which is uh, some major events in the history of turbulence. It's like a timeline of a rise of a civilization, really dramatic, critical milestones and development of humankind are listed here. And there are a few, to my, yeah, I, I, I'm very pleased to see some things that are not actually contained in other chapters, uh, like the KEM theory, all this, you know, hard mathematical stuff. Quantum turbulence, Feynman, 1955. Ruel and Tacken's strange attractors. And finally, the last, the last milestone is Mandelbrot, 1974, application of fractals. And this is the Polish link I was desperately trying to find, because Mandelbrot uh, grew up in this city, and actually he got his degree in mathematics in this very university. So I think altogether that this is another little part of the book extremely useful for all of us, and I would like to, you to join me in thanking the editors of this book for this terrific effort that will serve generations, honestly, I do believe that, 
and it's, it's, it's really extremely valuable. And I would like to thank especially Peter Davidson, who uh, is the chair of the committee that organized today's and tomorrow's event. And also would like to invite you to come back here tomorrow at 9 o'clock. So thank you very much to the editors. <laughs>